Let's talk about power series. Our goal is to find the interval of convergence for a power series. We want to find out what values of input produce a convergent series. The set of all the inputs that produce a convergent series is called the interval of convergence. The of convergence part is not the clever part of the name. The telling part of the name is the word interval. Since we're calling it the interval of convergence, we are describing the form of this set, the set of things, or the set of inputs that make a power series converge is going to take the form of an interval. There are three forms for the interval of convergence. There are three possibilities. And in typical math fashion, there's zero, there's one, and there's infinitely many. It's like a common thing. You get none, you get one, uh, you get everything. So there are three forms of the interval of convergence. First, It could be that the path, the interval of convergence is only the center of the series. So the first case is that the radius of convergence is zero. This means that the power series only converges when x is equal to a, the center of the series, and all the terms become zero. So here, the power series only converges when x is equal to a, and we zero out all the terms. The power series only converges when x is equal to a. That is, all the terms are zero. There's a graph of the interval convergence when the radius of convergence is zero. The idea is that we're going to have, uh, um, we always get convergence at the center of the series, and then we start expanding out from that depending on the coefficients. So way we can interpret, it, interpret this is we always have convergence at the center, and then the coefficients will determine how far around the center we get. We always get convergence at the center of the series. It makes all the terms aside from the constant, if the constant happens to not be zero. It makes all the terms equal to zero. We get C0 plus C1 times zero, plus C2 times zero squared. The coefficients will determine how much radius we have around the center.
power series always converges at at least one point where we zero out all the terms, except the constant term. Phase one, the radius of convergence is zero. We're going to have to identify what is it about the coefficients that gives us a radius of convergence of zero. Category two. <clears throat> Actually, I want to bring up the finite part first. Yeah. Now, I started with zero. So the radius of convergence is positive. So it's more than zero, but still finite. We know that a power series always converges at the center of the series. The coefficients determine how much space around the center the series converges. So what's happening here is that we're going to get some finite radius around the center of the series. So the power series will always converge at the center. Depending on the coefficients, we can get a finite radius around the center of the series. So we always get the center. Here we have some finite radius around the center. It's symmetric. We get R on the left and we get R on the right. A minus R, A plus R. We get everything in between. So we get plus R and minus R. We get a finite radius around the center. Neither of the endpoints, both of the endpoints, or one of the endpoints could be included. So zero, one, or two endpoints may be included in the interval of convergence. It could be zero, one, or both endpoints included in the interval of convergence. This will be determined by the coefficients. The same way we determine the radius, but we're going to have to do something other than the ratio test. The ratio test will not go tell us what's going on at the endpoints. We have to do something else. But this will be determined by the coefficients.
the things that could happen, we could end up with an open interval. That means neither endpoint is included. You have an open interval if neither endpoint is included. The power series diverges at both the endpoints. So we could describe that as um, A minus R strictly less than X, strictly less than A plus R as an inequality. Or we could describe it in interval notation with parentheses, A minus R, Spelled minus wrong. A plus R. Or if you like the reverse bracket thing. This one doesn't look safe to me. It looks like the, the two endpoints are just going to fall out of the bracket because there's no, no like they are holding the brackets, the stuff inside the brackets, but it looks unsafe. But I mean, it's it's valid. It just looks unsafe. Because both the endpoints, or because neither endpoint is included, we can use an in absolute value inequality. Although R is not the middle, R is the radius. So as a special case, because the in the compound inequality, we have the same kind of inequality. We could say that this is the absolute value of X minus A is less than R. So in this case, our compound inequality can be expressed as an, as an absolute value inequality. <clears throat> so our three styles, uh, writing it out, our three styles are compound inequality, interval notation, or an absolute value inequality, since our compound inequality, both the inequalities and our compound inequality match. They're both strictly less than. So because the inequalities in our compound inequality are the same, they're both strictly less than, we get to use an absolute value inequality. We can summarize with an absolute value inequality. This is because both, uh, neither endpoint is included. So this happened. Because neither endpoint is included. So this is the when the interval of convergence is an open interval, not the power series diverges at both endpoints of our interval of convergence.
We could also use a graph like we did up here, where A is the middle, A plus R is the top, A minus R is the bottom. That's harder to type though, so. So one thing that can happen if our radius of convergence is positive and finite is that we get an open interval. That is, neither endpoint is included. There is no highest value or lowest value in the interval of convergence. We could get a closed interval. This is where both of the endpoints are included in the interval of convergence. There is a lowest value for which the power series converges and a highest value for which the power series converges. The endpoints are included. Drawing a picture. This is how we would graph it. We would put the two brackets in with the, the serif on the brackets pointing towards each other. Say so all this stuff inside. So here is the graph. We could write this in interval notation with square brackets from A minus R at the bottom to A plus R at the top. We could write it as a compound inequality where we'll use the symbol less than or equal to. So I'll have A minus R is less than or equal to X is less than or equal to A, spelled A wrong, to A plus R. And like with our open interval, since both of the endpoints are included, the two endpoints are doing the same thing. The, top, the two inequalities in the compound inequality are the same. We can summarize with an absolute value inequality. I like the absolute value inequality because that's the thing that falls out of the uh, ratio test. The limit from the ratio test will be some number times the absolute value of X minus A. And this gives us an opportunity to interpret this expression. Absolute value of X minus A less than raised to R says this is everything within R units of A. So X minus A less than or equal to R is everything within R units of A. That's how we want to look at this symbol and interpret it. Here's A in the middle, everything R units above and R units below. So when we see absolute X minus A less than or equal to R, we read this as everything within R units of A.
it labels A as the middle and R, the distance will go away from the middle on both sides. So we could have an open interval, neither endpoint is inevitable. Convergence power series diverges at both endpoints. We can have a closed interval. Both endpoints are included in the interval of convergence. The power series diverges at both endpoints. The other thing that can happen is that interval is half open or half closed. One of the endpoints is included, the other is not. So it could be that we include the bottom, or we don't include the bottom, but we do include the top. So we have A minus R is not included in the interval of convergence, but A plus R is included. In a compound inequality, x will be strictly greater than a minus r, but less than or equal to a plus r. Or it could be flipped the other way around. In the case where we have a half open or half closed interval of convergence, we don't get to use absolute value inequality because the compound inequality and inequalities don't match. So absolute value inequality notation not available. The absolute value inequality is not available for half open interval. But if you subscribe to Math VPN, you can change your location to some other country where half open interval do have absolute value inequality. Math VPN is not. These are just three different ways of describing the positive and finite radius of time. 
first. The reason I say positive is that zero is finite. So I don't know what I'm going to say finite. Zero is finite, but it's not positive. So that's why I need that positive. If I start with the last one and make that one first, then instead of saying, then the middle one is not positive and finite, I'd say finite and positive, and then end with zero. But today, I've decided to go in this order. First, the radius of convergence is zero. Next, the radius of convergence is positive, but finite. So you can probably guess what the third one is. The radius of convergence is infinite. It still converges at the center, but we're getting everything on both sides. So it's kind of really ridiculous to draw it. This means that the power series converges no matter the value of x. The power series converges for all x. In interval notation, we would say negative infinity to infinity. This is the interval notation for all real numbers. We never think of infinity as a number, so we never want to put square brackets and say, oh, it includes infinity. All real numbers is, a, is, a, is not a closed interval. All real numbers is, is open. You use open interval notation. We might just write the description all real numbers, or if we want to be fancy, we'll make the double R symbol for all real numbers. The graph would be kind of ridiculous if we just draw a number line. I'll make it bigger than all the number lines that we've had so far to really emphasize the infiniteness of it. The third thing that okay? It seems like a lot to remember, but that's only because it's a lot to remember, and you have to remember all of it all the time in perfect detail. Actually, you need to be in it and not remember everything in perfect detail, but you do have to remember what should be called. Like it's fine if you can't recite what the double angle identities are, but you have to know of the existence of double angle identities so you can go to Google and ask for the double angle identities. I think there should be a section on math that it's like, oh, what is this thing called? It writes down double angle identity and you have to write down double angle identity. If you want to use Google, if you want to justify not knowing some equation or formula or some shit like that, by claiming that you can just Google it, then you have to, you can demonstrate mastery by demonstrating that you can Google it. Like, ah, I would just look that up. Great, Google it for me right now. I don't know what to search for. Then you can't Google it. Say it. Of course, my other favorite math trope, 
Oh, I know the concept, I just don't remember the formula. Then I look at the notes and someone has written the slope formula on their notes. I'm like, oh, no. If you have to write down the slope formula, you don't know what the slope is. If you have to write down the slope formula of all things, you do not understand the concept. Okay. Or my favorite. Once the problem is set up, I can do the problem. I just get, I just get stuck on setting up the problem. Happens a lot in algebra classes. That one is the most insidious because from a certain perspective, that's kind of what the education system wants. You don't, we don't want the general population to be able to set up and solve problems in math. We just want to take a problem that they've been handed and do the calculations. It's less noticeable today because we have another way of doing calculations and the humans have been replaced. But in olden days, before we could just ask Siri what the result is, we had to have humans act as our computing machine. So we dehumanized you. We separated you out by looking for students that could take a problem and set it up and say, ah, this one knows. This one can do the math. The rest of them can just do the computation. So we send the rest of them that just do the computation to just do the computations school. My point is that setting up the problem is understanding the problem. Doing the calculation is just a trick. In case you're wondering, yes, this is my variation of saying, why are we doing a lot of this stuff? Wolfram Alpha exists. Not as an argument for not knowing shit, but as an argument for changing our emphasis on the kinds of shit that we do. Here's our goal. We want to be able to read what's going on in a power series and determine the interval of convergence, including the endpoints, just by looking at it. The point of being in math class is to not have to write down all the fucking math all the time. We can use the ratio test to find the interval of convergence. The last thing that we want to have to do is to write down the ratio test so we can find the interval of convergence. It is better to just know what is going to happen. Here is our most basic power series. This is the one we looked at yesterday. The interval of convergence for this power series was the x had to be less than 1 in absolute value. The endpoints were not included. The radius of convergence is 1. The center of this series is at 0, and the coefficients were always 1. The coefficient is always what is one for all n, and a is equal to zero. We can move this left and right, and that won't change what happens with the coefficient. These are the most basic coefficients that we can get. These are the most basic coefficients that we can get. This is the black copy of our series. It is the most basic.
That's an important thing to remember. To level at people who use drinking black coffee as part of their personality. And watch someone go up to Starbucks, have an order that takes five minutes to just speak aloud, and then accuse that person of being basic. Anyway, what are we talking about? This is our black coffee. Let's think about how things can change. If I move this around, if I look at the series, n equals zero to infinity, I'm not going to change the coefficients. I'm going to change. Oops, there's an x to the n. Oosh. I'll move the center over to three. So we get one plus x minus 3 plus x minus 3 squared, and so on. Our coefficients haven't changed, but our center is now at 3. Our radius of convergence, or sorry, our interval of convergence is just the absolute value of x minus three, the common ratio since this is geometric. In the first problem, we had everything within one unit of zero. Zero was at the center, negative one at the bottom, positive one at the top. When we switch to x minus three to the n, the coefficients didn't change, so the radius of convergence isn't gonna change. All that changes is where the center is. So in the middle, we're gonna have three. Down below, we'll have two, and above, we'll have four. Endpoints are not included. This is mainly a geometric in form. There's a common radius of x minus 3 to the n. Exponential things adjust your finite positive radius of convergence. Exponential factors show up and affect the positive finite radius of convergence. If we think about what's going to happen at the ratio test, the x minus three is going to leave uh, to the end is going to leave behind an x minus absolute x minus three. The five to the end of the denominator will leave a five in the denominator in the limit from the ratio test. So we're going to get absolute value of x minus three over five less than one. So the limit from the ratio test will be absolute value of x minus three over five is less than one, which we will write as the absolute value of x minus three 
has to be less than five. That is our interval of convergence. Everything within five units of three. We have to remember that we have a lot of control. We're plugging in different values of x. So even though it looks like this polynomial, that's just going to grow to infinity because the coefficients are just going to keep getting bigger. But we have to remember that those coefficients, that 5 to the n coefficient, is being multiplied by an x minus 3 to the n. There's another exponential factor there balancing stuff out. Our limit from the ratio test here will be the absolute, uh, will be 5 times the absolute value of x minus three. And since it's a ratio test, we get convergence if five times the absolute value of x minus three is less than one. We would solve for the absolute value part and say the absolute value of x minus three has to be less than one fifth. So we'll have three in the middle, three and a fifth at the top, and three and negative one-fifth at the bottom. Normally we don't write three and negative one-fifth, we write that as the more common form, two and four-fifths. I think math might make more sense. This is one of the cases where if we use Calvin math, Calvin and Hobbes math, it might actually make more sense. Expand our concept of what these numbers are. So two and four-fifths is the same as three and negative one-fifth. Exponential factors affect the positive finite radius. Since we're out of time, I'm just going to point out that uh, rational and radical factors only affect the endpoints. That's how that's where we look to see if the endpoints are in or out. So the examples that we'll have coming back: rational and radical factors. will affect the endpoints. Factorial factors is how we get zero, a radius of uh, zero or an infinite radius. These are the things that we're going to look for when we look at the general term of our power series. We want to think about where the middle is. That's going to be our base case. Our base radius is one. Exponential factors are how we're going to make a positive, a different positive finite radius. Rational and radical factors are only going to tell us what's going on at the endpoints. And factorial factors means we should be on the lookout for zero radius or infinite radius. Not a guarantee that we'll have a zero or an infinite. But if there's one unchallenged n factorial in the denominator of our general term, we're probably going to have an infinite radius of convergence. All right, that's going to do it for today. That's going to do it for this week. I'll be in my office on Friday. There is no class tomorrow. Everybody have a good weekend, and thanks for playing.